Um, all right, so let's start out with, well, first of all, uh, I had a great time here, and I, wonderful talking with the faculty members to talk with today, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so let's start with a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm on a uh, sabbatical like leave. I'm on a two-year leave where I'm 20% MIT and 80% Google, and so we're starting up a, a, a vision team in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, so there's MIT, there's this data center, and there's like three minutes away, there are these Google offices in Cambridge, and that's where we work. And uh, we have uh, these people on the team now, we're doing kind of work at the intersection of vision and graphics, and uh, we hire summer interns. So uh, if you're interested in, in working for a summer uh, with us, <coughs> send me an email. Um, okay. So we wanted to make a motion microscope. And uh, so what would a motion microscope be? So a regular microscope, you take a, 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 an image and you enlarge it, make it bigger. And a motion microscope then, you take a video as input and you're gonna make a new video as an output. And the difference is that the small motions in the input video are gonna be amplified. So uh, that's our goal. And Strangely, I've been working on this problem for like years, for like six or seven years. We first did an early version a long time ago, in 2005, SIGGRAPH, and um, it, it kind of worked, but it never really caught on. And that was because it was really hard to get it to work well. You really needed um, uh, this person there to be working on the problem for you, and, and he could make it work, but other people, it, it was difficult to. And so the, we, we <coughs> We did it in the, the first way that you would think of if you were a computer vision researcher, which is, so you want to make the motion microscope, so let's see, so you're going to first measure the motion everywhere, and then uh, treat the image like a, like a collection of colored marbles, and figure out how, how every marble is moving, and then you just move it that much more, some factor like 20 or 40, and that's your motion magnified output. It turns out that's really susceptible to any mistake you make in the motion analysis. It just makes the whole thing totally blow up and doesn't work at all. But, I want to show you what we first did to kind of convey the idea, and then I'll tell you how uh, this new approach we've done recently in the past <coughs> few years, uh, which is much more reliable, and uh, it now it kind of works well. So, but here's the early version we did. Um, okay, so there's the swing set behind my house, and that's my wife on the swing, <laughs> and uh, she's the, uh, and the weight of this, under the weight of the swinger, the, the beam at the top moves just a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna do it the hard way now, that's the early way. We uh, first track feature points, and this is really hard to do with occlusion boundaries and not make mistakes, but uh, find feature points everywhere, and then we're gonna cluster them for common motions. So uh, now we're gonna interpolate, or, right, so we, we color them according to their common motion, and then now we're gonna interpolate between those, those uh, labeled feature points and into kind of segments that are each moving in their own special way. Okay, now the user steps in and says, okay, take the red things, red pixels, and move them, exaggerate their motion by a factor of 40. Okay, so we this. Now we're gonna kind of put it all back together. So we take those pixels and, and move them by that extra amount. So that's here, but up now we've, we've got these holes where the, uh, we didn't see the image data, so we've got to fill it in by texture synthesis. And that gives you this image. And then uh, if, there's, if there are any remaining artifacts, you can go and fix them by hand. And so here's the motion, the final motion magnified output. And my wife looks at this and asks if the video makes her look heavy. <laughs> well, you know, a little bit. <laughs> um, but this, so that's, that was the hard way. And as I said, it, it was kind of cute, but it never really caught on. And then we recently revisited it in really in sort of an accidental way. It's sort of interesting how it was accidental. So let me just tell you, we were, um, we were interested in measuring um, vital signs or a particular pulse of someone at a distance from a video camera. And we were inspired by a paper that did this by uh, Ross Picard and collaborators at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, but they did it in a, what we felt was a kind of overly difficult way. And we wanted to reproduce the results and also just do it in a much simpler way. So, so here's a, uh, it's gonna seem like a detour, but we'll get it back around to motion magnification. So for now, we're gonna talk about looking at color changes caused by pulse. So it turns out that we're all, uh, you know, our uh, 
pulse is pushing oxygenated blood to our skin, and uh, over time, the color of our skin changes just a little bit. And you're all doing that right now, but I can't see it, you can't see it, because it's just kind of below the level of uh, threshold of our perception. But you can measure it. So first of all, let's see how we might measure it. So here's, uh, this is going to be a video, and here, let's look at these three places on the person's skin. Here's uh, time, and here's uh, intensity uh, rescaled. So instead of 0 to 55, it's centered here. Let's call that 0. Now here are the raw intensity output. So we're going to take RGB and convert it to a luminance signal. And these are the values. And it's really hard to see any pulse here. Mm -hmm. I don't see it in these uh, plots. And you can even see kind of quantization noise as you, it hops from one quantized value to another. So you really don't see the pulse there. But if you do something just as uh, brain dead simple as averaging over a sp spatial region of around 20 by 20 pixel, a little Gaussian blur, and then display the average value of that spatial region over time, you get these plots instead. Now you can start to see kind of a pulse. First of all, I, we've stretched up the vertical scale, so the intensities uh, now just go from, um, this is you know one value, another, another. And, and so you can see these variations are about half of a unit where the total dynamic range is on a 0 to 55 scale. So it's not very much. So you have to average over a lot of pixels to see it, but you can see it. And let's do a little bit of straightforward signal processing to make it even clearer. So we'll take one of those traces, and we'll band pass filter it to pull out, to sort of accentuate the variations that are at this uh, frequency. Uh, so we take a difference of two band pass filter, or two low pass filters, and we get this band pass filter. And now you can see very clearly these peaks, and um, you can verify by other me methods of measuring pulse that these do indeed correspond to this person's pulse. And, um, and so this is kind of a simpler way. We can, it has some advantages. We can find the spatial position where the pulse happens. And also, we can do this very simple thing of saying, well, let's, let's see what this looks like. So we can take this bandpass signal and just exaggerate it and add it, add it back in, pixel by pixel, all over to get a new output video where the color changes have been amplified. So let's do that here. So here's the input video is playing. The person's obviously not moving much. Uh, and then here's the uh, color amplified version. So um, this might, I mean, so it's kind of fun to look at. It's fun to imagine that that's what we're all doing now, even though we can't see it. Um, how might this be useful? Possibly uh, you could examine asymmetries in the blood flow of different parts of the skin. And that would be useful diagnostically. Uh, we, you can also go from that visualization. You can actually uh, come up with a number for what the pulse is. So at every patch, you get some signal like this. And you can very simply find the peaks of this to find a local uh, pulse of time. And you can do that for all the patches uh, lined up vertically here. And there's time. And the white is where the peak occurred. And you can take the median of all those peaks for all the patches to find a, a kind of global pulse signal. Um, and we. Uh, verify that this gives you this uh, answer that's consistent with what you get by uh, contact-based measurements. So this was a, a simple study we did with uh, Dr. Donna Brzezinski at Winchester Hospital. And uh, the reason why we're using neonatal infants here is because um, she tells us that Dr. Sells, you're supposed to handle them as little as possible. So if you had a non-contact way of measuring the pulse, that would be useful. And here's the value we get from the video, and here's the value that the contact-based ECG gets, and they do pretty well. And you can do that in real time? Yeah, let's see, sorry. Um, we could do it in real time. I don't think we didn't do it in real time here, but we could, yes. Um, OK. And it doesn't have to be videos we take. So here's uh, from Batman Begins. Here's uh, Christian Bale. And you can see he does have a pulse. Um, <laughs> So, so this is all about color amplification. When we looked at the color amplified video, <coughs> we scratched our heads because it sure looked to us like the head was moving, uh, that the motion of the head had been amplified by doing this color processing. And it didn't make any sense to us. You know, why should that be? We sit at one position, we amplify the color differences, and we get this extra motion. Um, anyway, so we scratched our heads until we figured it out, which actually is pretty simple. Um, at this time in the afternoon, I'll skip through much of the math. We have a nice, simple graphical story, which explains why. 
Okay, here's space, here's intensity. Suppose that the gray sinusoid is your uh, image intensity as a function of position. And suppose that the blue sinusoid is the small motion translation of it. So, you know, even though he was more or less holding still, he did move his head a little bit as the pulse went to his head. And so what we do with this color processing is we sit in one position, we look at how much it changes, and we exaggerate how much it changes. So if you do that, look at this difference and go up to this higher value, you get to this red curve. <coughs> and if this region here is flat, you'll get exactly, locally flat, you'll get exactly the same value doing that as you would have if you sat at this, this position, looked at how much the blue line had translated spatially, and exaggerated that amount of spatial translation. Uh, so you go from there to there. So you get the exact same red curve if locally it's uh, a straight line everywhere. And um, so those of you who are double E's or physics undergraduates, you will see this is going to start to sound like a local Taylor series approximation to this image intensity as a function of position. And um, I won't drag us through this, but it's really straightforward that if you have this function, which is uh, the image is a function of space and time, it's some frozen envelope that's just wiggling over time. If you do a first order Taylor series expansion and take the time for any part and exaggerate it, you get the exact same answer as if you would have taken the motion part and exaggerated that as well. And that approximation holds for, uh, you know, when, when the first order Taylor series approximation holds, and you can work that out too. So if you assume you, what you have is a sinusoid, and you want to figure out where the linearized approximation to that uh, translated version exactly equals the uh, true um, additional of cosines version of that, uh, well, again, I'm just skipping the math, but just to give you a flavor of it. Uh, you want uh, this term to equal one, and this, this sign of this argument to equal the argument. That's where the first order of the <coughs> approximation holds. And if you want that to be true to within 90%, point 0.9, then you want the product of these three terms to be less than pi over four. What are those three terms? You want the magnification amount to be fairly small, so it's going to break down if you try to magnify the thing too much. You want the spatial frequency to be fairly small, Sorry, the, the, right, the um, frequency is small, so the, the, the period or the size of these things to be large. So for, it's going to work best for large scale structures in the image. And then the true displacement to be small, well, that's okay because we're interested in amplifying small motions, so those are going to be small anyway. So this gives you a little prescription for where this little trick is going to work well. And so you can, and then here's uh, just a graphical indication. Again, we've taken a, a black sinusoid in each case and translated different translated different amounts to give us this rainbow of different translations. And here's our approximate exaggeration of the translation for the lower frequency thing, the thing that varies more slowly over the image. Uh, this approximation is pretty good. This rainbow looks kind of like that rainbow. But when we get to the higher frequency things, which is to say the, uh, the sharp edges or the fine details in the image, then it starts to break down. We get con uh, saturation increase, and it doesn't move as far as it should. Okay. Um, anyway, this, this kind of motivates a multi-scale approach. You take your input video here, so it's the space, space, and time. And we're going to process it different, at, at different spatial frequency bands, so different levels of detail. Here's the fine detail, here's the coarse detail. We know that we can exaggerate the coarse detail more than we can exaggerate the fine detail. And we can have a little prescription if we're going to exaggerate the uh, coarse detail. And if, when it becomes fine detail, we're going to ease up and not going to try to exaggerate as much. And voila, here's the resulting uh, processing output. So I went on the red line in Cambridge to Boston and put up my camera, and it bounces around along with the train. And so here's the input video, and here's the motion magnified video using this method that I showed you. And it does a reasonable job of exaggerating things. And this is what kind of got us into now into the motion magnification business again, because this way we don't have to estimate motion. We just do this, these really single processing tricks on it. And it's, it's, it's much more reliable than, than when we had to do computer vision. Now we're just doing signal processing, which is much easier. Um, so let me show you some results of this early method, and then we're going to improve it one more time before the end of the talk. Um, so the canonical place where you might want to have a motion microscope is you're the parents of a perfectly healthy newborn baby, but you, every night you sit there and look at your baby and ask, is the baby breathing? <laughs> Uh, and so here's your input video. Uh, you know, you're not sure. It's really hard to tell there's not much motion going on. 
but in the motion magnified version, it's coming. Sorry. There we go. Um, in the motion, so here's the video playing, not much motion. Here's the motion magnified, and you can see from the changes on here, the exaggerated the motion a bit. Uh, let me point out some changes, some problems that we're going to fix with it soon. Uh, there's some contrast entries here, we're going to fix that. There's extra noise, and it's not moving quite as far as we want. So we're going to fix all those just in a second. Um, but let's look at some other things. So here's, uh, again, another different way to look at the pulse. Here's the person's arm is the input. Here's the output. Motion magnified, you can see that. Whereas we couldn't before. Um, you can also kind of uh, focus the motion magnification, if you will, by selecting the temporal frequencies where you want the motion amplified. So uh, here's a here's a thing moving, here's a motion magnified using this method. Let's get a whole set of them, each moving differently. So this is moving, wiggling at 7 hertz, 5 hertz, 3 hertz, 2 hertz. And we can apply a temporal filter to, to select out which of those motions we want to exaggerate the motion of. So we, we just temporally filter each of those band pass versions by this filter. And it selects out just the 2, frequent, two hertz signal to exaggerate, or you can do the 3 hertz. So you can kind of select, select which parts of the scene you want the motion exaggerated for. Um, and just a word about the name, we, we call this Eulerian video magnification to distinguish it from the Lagrangian approach. And both of these things are borrowing terminology from the um, fluid mechanics literature. In a, in a Lagrangian formulation, you sort of ride along with the fluid and you have your coordinate system moving there. In, in Eulerian, you're sitting and you watch the fluid move underneath you. So uh, this is an Eulerian approach, and the thing we did first before was a little Lagrangian. So we, Eulers sit there on the bridge watching things flow underneath him. Um, okay, so uh, we, we, we posted our code, and uh, it's just wonderful in this modern era that we live in that uh, people look at it and they try it out themselves. So I just want to show you some things that other people did with our code, uh, and then they made their own ports and so forth. Um, so here is the world's first rodent to undergo Eulerian video magnification, um, <laughs> Tiffany is And um, there's another one that someone posted. This is uh, you know, Craig Bell, and you can see the uh, fetus moving around inside. And again, my wife tells me that this is what it feels like, <laughs> um, but I don't know. <clears throat> Okay, but then there are these problems that we want to fix. I, I was mentioning before. Uh, so let me just give you a graphical explanation of what the problem is and how we're going to fix it. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this will mostly make sense to people who have studied uh, complex variables or electrical engineering. But um, if not, if you haven't, then I hope this makes somewhat sense anyway. You can represent the sinusoid as a so-called phase or a little complex number that uh, you multiply by the time varying part, and that gives you a representation for the time varying signal taking into account as local phase. What we're doing with our little algorithm, so here's the real numbers, here's the imaginary numbers, this is in the complex plane. The, the trick that we did with this Taylor series approximation is here's one sinusoid, here's another one that's moved slightly relative to it, so it changes phase a little bit. And with this Taylor series approximation, what we're doing is drawing a straight line between those two phasers and we're amplifying it by moving to some other point along that line. So that, that picture right there shows you right away what the problems are going to be with this method that I've described. And that is you can't wrap all the way around. You can't really continue on that. You can only go on this line. So you can't, go, can't move it as far as you'd like. And the second problem is you get the amplitude wrong. Instead of becoming a uh, sinusoid of, of this amplitude, so the radius of the circle tells you how, uh, what the amplitude of the sinusoid is, you're going to get a, a, a larger sinusoid than what you started with, and that's not good. Instead, what we'd like to do is just take the sinusoid and just report, can keep on wrapping it around the circle. So this is maybe sine phase, and we want to move it to minus cosine phase, and minus sine and cosine, just keep on going around the circle like that. And, um, and again, pardon me if um, this explanation doesn't seem natural. It's, it's sort of designed for electrical, electrical engineers. But if you take that, if you sort of follow that graphical instruction, you can do it by just using a very simple change of representation for the input image. And um, so you've probably all heard of the Fourier transform, which is 
if you take an image and you put in some other representation, then it makes various important things explicit in that other representation, and you might process it and then go back to the image representation. We're going to do the same thing here, only not using a Fourier transform, using a, a, a multi-scale oriented pyramid transform. It's called a spherical pyramid. What really matters is that, say this is your input image, here's what the representation looks like. You, you have a, a little pair of uh, little sine and cosine localized basis functions, little oriented filters, and the important issue is that at every point in the image, at every position and orientation and scale, you have a little pair of wavelets, a sine phase and a cosine phase one, and that's what the transform gives you. And you can go from an image to that, and from that back to an image. So here's the brain dead simple way we're gonna do motion magnification. Now, we take each frame of the video, transform it to that wavelet representation, and we look for every different position, orientation, and scale we measure the phase, like the, uh, the arc tan of the sine or the cosine of this little wavelet. And, and that is, an ex is, a, is a representation of the position. And so we watch how the phase changes over time, and we exaggerate it by the amount we want the motion amplified. And then that gives you new coefficient values for what the little sine or cosine wavelet uh, magnitudes are at that position. We do that for all positions, orientation, and scale. That gives us a modified transform, and then we go back down to the image <coughs> domain, and that's our processed frame for that time, and then we go on to the next time. Just proceed that way. Um, and we might, in the middle there, do some temporal filtering to pull out the variations that we're most interested in, the frequency variations. So really it's all about just changing the representation of the image, mucking with things there, and going back. And it's, uh, for, a, for a signal processor, it's just brain dead simple. And, and it kind of works every time. And it's sort of embarrassing that we took us so long to find this, but uh, it works quite well. And so the, now the processing looks like this. You have an input frame, uh, many concatenated frames behind that. You transform it to a steerable pyramid. You calculate the phase. You muck with the phase. You exaggerate the changes over time. And then go back down to the, from the pyramid representation back to the image. And that's all we do. And, sorry, so here are the new results now, the new improved, uh, so it's the third one we've done. We have the vision-based method, now the signal processing, now the improved signal processing method. Again, here's our input, is the baby breathing, and now here's the output. Now we can push it much farther, really exaggerate things more than we could before, and we have much less noise in the back. So that's the, that's the motion microscope. And what's nice about it is now, uh, we can get it to work in real time. It just doesn't break in the same way that the other ones did. And uh, we think and hope that it's a useful tool for a number of different engineering disciplines. So now the rest of the talk, the bulk of it, I get to show you different examples of this and try to persuade you that it's interesting and useful. And um, I gotta say, what's really fun about this project, it's really one of the most fun projects I've worked on. And it's because I get to go around the physical world and ask, uh, where might there be tiny motions that would be interesting or informative if we exaggerated those motions and looked at them? So it's like having a new kind of microscope to explore the world with, and it's been very fun. Um, so we can exaggerate people, we can exaggerate things. So here's a big crane, and uh, it moves a little bit in the wind, and we can exaggerate how it moves in the wind. I can see it flexing and moving around. Uh, we had a, uh, I should mention we had a, a spatial mask here, so we didn't exaggerate these motions. They're, they're unchanged, but we just exaggerated things uh, on the crane. So, yes. so do these motions, in order to exaggerate them, do they have to be low frequency and relatively smooth? Or can it be a step function that's very small? Uh, it could be a step function. Um, so, uh, let's see the requirements. So we have to have a static camera for the stuff I'm showing you. and motions should be reasonably small. If they're big motions, this is going to generate artifacts. And I can show you that we have a real-time demo. I'll show you that on the laptop and I'll show that. Um, oh yeah, so so you should start out, you should ask, well, gee, wait a minute, are these motions veridical? Is this really what I would have seen if the motions were that much bigger? So let's do an experiment. This was collaborative with our civil engineering colleagues at MIT. Um, uh, and they had this whole structure with an accelerometer, and they hit it with a hammer. And they hit it lots of different times with a hammer. One time with taps, <coughs> big taps, 
And they got a pair of taps where uh, one version was 50 times bigger than the other. You know, the accelerations were 50 times bigger in this one than in this one. So that's ground truth motion magnification. That's what you would have gotten if you would hit it 50 times harder. And we can compare that output with what we really do get. So um, <coughs> here's a comparison of it. This is a line in the video. And here's a little space-time picture of what goes on in that line over time. So here's uh, horizontal position, just like horizontal position there. But here's the output video over time, time plotted vertically. So here's the input source when we tapped it very lightly. And you can see that the lines are all vertical, meaning there's really not much change in the position of things over time, not much motion going on. So it's a straight line in a you know, space-time plot. Here's ground truth motion magnified, a different run where we hit it 50 times harder and you can see the thing wiggle back and forth. Here's the computationally motion magnified version of this one where we just computationally exaggerated the motion by 50 times. And you can see they're in reasonable agreement with each other. Here's another measure of agreement. The uh, accelerometer output is plotted in a blue dotted line. And the measured displacement, it's not exaggerated, just the measured displacement, is plotted in the red line. You can see there in good uh, measured uh, acceleration. You can see there in good agreement. And then here's uh, kind of the video outputs. Here's the input video, compu uh, motion, computationally motion magnified, and ground truth motion magnified. And they're, they're in pretty good agreement with each other. OK, so uh, we think and hope that this has application in physics and engineering and looking at people. So show you um, some of the uh, things we put it to. And I, I guess the kind of the sort of theme of our research groups, and I, also, I should mention, by the way, this was done in collaboration with Professor Prado Durand. Uh, we worked on this together for like 10 years, and, um, <coughs> and uh, our students. Um, so let's see, let's look at physics. OK, so this is lovely. This was um, a, again, by Justin Chen in civil engineering. I don't know if you can guess what this is, but I'll, I'll tell you what it is. So this is a PVC pipe you would end on. And then there's a little hammer coming down and hitting the pipe. Now, what should happen? Well, so first of all, here's what does happen. This is a high-speed video. It's going to come down and hit it. There it goes. Bam, it hits it. And the thing deforms a little bit. OK, so um, by the way, just to get my audience, how many of you studied physics or electrical engineering say, an undergrad or graduate school. OK, that's pretty good. Um, great. So we all know what's supposed to happen, which is that you're going to excite the different normal modes of vibration with this impulse. And each of them is going to oscillate at their own characteristic frequency with their own characteristic uh, deformation of shape. So the low frequency one is going to be like a, an ellipse that, that oscillates back and forth. The, the next. Uh, Order one is going to have uh, three humps, and that it uh, wiggles back and forth uh, this way and then that way, and then the next order has um, four and so forth. So we can actually see those now. So we, we take the motion microscope and we, we filter it temporally, uh, selecting each of the different normal mode frequencies of the pipe, and then exaggerate whatever's going on at that frequency, and we can see the different uh, shapes of the normal modes of oscillation. And here they are. So you can look at this and say, ah, I see that the, uh, the higher order mode um, dies down more quickly. And it also has smaller amplitudes. So these are magnified by factors of 200, 400, and 1,200, respectively. And so it's useful for education. And we also think or hope that it might be useful for inspection as well. Uh, my colleagues tell me that if you damage the pipe and look at the resulting shape, it's going to be different than if it's not damaged. So where else might there be small oscillations? Well, our small vibrations. Uh, in the transition to turbulence, um, there are these small uh, nonlinearities in the land. So this is laminar flow, and then it becomes turbulent flow. And there are small oscillations called palmage flicking waves, which get larger and larger, and then the region becomes turbulent. So we can see those now. Let's, let's, let's motion magnify this video. And here's the output, and it's hard to see what's going on as the video is playing. But if we freeze a frame and compare with the original, so here's a frozen frame of the original, and here's a corresponding frozen frame of the motion magnified version. And now you can see these, these oscillations that get larger and larger uh, streamlines and stabilities at, at, at 
as it transitions from laminar flow to turbulent flow. Um, and this is sort of a good uh, example illustrating the difference between uh, a microscope and a motion microscope. Okay, so again, looking at our little example with the image as a function of space and time being a frozen envelope F that's wiggling as a function of time. A size microscope takes all the arguments of our little frozen envelope and multiplies them by M to give you a bigger image. A motion microscope only takes the moving parts and multiplies them by M. And even more than that, it just takes the parts that you're, the frequencies that you're amplifying and multiplies them by M and leaves the other ones unchanged. And just to see that difference visually, um, if we were to take the original and try to see those tonally shifting waves by using a size magnification, well, that's going to do just the opposite of what we want. We're not going to see those curves more clearly. We're going to see them as more as straight lines. So here's a size magnified by 40. But here's that same video uh, with the video sequence motion magnified by 40. And here you can see the oscillations. Um, this might not play well in the back, but uh, it's the right time of year, so I can show these. This is from behind my house. It wasn't a windy day at all. Uh, here's the original, and here are different frequency applications of this original kind of quiet day picture of trees. Here's the low frequency oscillations. This is funny. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Here's the low frequency oscillations amplified. This is 0.1 to 0.5 hertz, and you can see it's kind of the I, mean, I hope you can see it's sort of the branches moving. And then here's higher frequency, and finally 2.5 to 4 hertz amplified. And, and here at this frequency, you can see the leaves kind of shimmering in this very, very low wind. And again, this is all from this input video. Um, OK, engineering applications. So uh, this is uh, done in collaboration with uh, Russ Tedrick's group, where they had the DARPA Robotics Challenge. They had this great Funky robot Atlas uh, from uh, Boston Dynamics. And Atlas is powered by hydraulic pulses through the hydraulic uh, pipes. And so can, we've looked at human pulses, now we're going to look at a robot's pulse. Uh, and so, um, sorry. Right. So, left is the input video. This is part of this thigh. And right is the motion magnified. And you can see now the different structures as they move uh, as the hydraulic fluid uh, pumps through the robot. And we couldn't see this in the input video, but it was from this that we concluded uh, this motion magnified version. So, so this kind of shows you how things are wiggling. And I guess I like to say that um, you know big catastrophic motions are often preceded by little small motions and movements. And so we can use this microscope to, to see how everything's going at, a, at, at very small displacements to maybe predict or, or identify uh, problems before they happen. Um, here's another one in the robotics realm that relates to that. So this is the inverted pendulum. And again, this is from Russ Tedrick's lab. Um, there's, this is high-speed video with 1,000 hertz. And this is uh, the inverted pendulum balancing upside down. There's a little controller there that moves the thing around to keep this thing balanced upside down. Now, we have two different versions of it. Once when the bolts were tight, everything was as supposed to be, and the other ones when we loosened the bolts. In the raw high-speed video, I can't really see any difference between these two versions. Uh, I mean, one it moves a little bit more in one than the other, but, um, but as far as the control processing, there's no difference. But the motion magnifier. Now you can see that this guy on the right wiggles around, or the one where the bolts have been loosened. Uh, it, it looks a bit more unstable than the one on the left where the bolts were tight properly, tightened properly. So this might be a way to identify problems again before they happen. Um, okay, another collaboration. This is with uh, uh, Katia Bertoli at Harvard. They designed crazy metamaterials. Uh, so here's a cross-section of it, and the idea is when you wiggle it here with the shaker uh, at a certain temporal frequency of vibration, they have designed it so that the oscillations here die out very quickly across space. But they're really tiny oscillations, and the way they measure how, whether they're doing the right thing or not, is with a so-called laser vibrometer, that's sort of the competition for measuring small motions, 
It's a laser just like this one that looks at a single point and makes a measurement of how things are moving at that one point. So let's take a look at their input. So, so, but it, we'd like to see the whole pattern. And I should say, sorry, this is also what their theory tells them. This is from a, a computational simulation of these things, how the motions should be going if things are according, according to plan. Let me show you a high-speed video of the thing as it's being oscillated. There it is, pretty boring. They're really tiny motions, <laughs> okay? You can't see much. And um, this is kind of the same pattern with all these videos I'm showing you. Version A, you can't see much. Version B, you motion magnify, you can see more. So let's motion magnify this. And ah, now you can see the, the different oscillations. You can see they have the form that's predicted by their computer simulations. You can see that as desired, they, they uh, taper off according to the spatial distance away from this part on the right where they're being oscillated. So again, this might be useful for engineering applications. Um, and then people, it's fun to look at people with these things. So here's my daughter, uh, and this is the input video. I asked her not to do anything, just stay still. Um, and here's uh, different temporal frequencies of someone amplified as they're staying still. So here's the low frequencies, and uh, 0.1 to 0.5 hertz. And what do you see there? What do you think that? Correspond. Yeah, it looks like breathing. Uh, here's uh, mid-band, 1 to 2 hertz, amplified. And it's hard to tell what that is. Uh, some people look at it and say, aha, micro-expressions, we can read her mind, you know? <laughs> and we have no idea whether they can read someone's mind this way. It could just be that uh, <coughs> random perturbations of uh, facial features make us think that someone's making an expression. Uh, I don't know, or it could be it does reveal something we don't know, we haven't studied that. And then here's the higher frequencies, two and a half to four and a half hertz amplified. And you can see the eye saccades, and you can see a little bit of noise that ramifies in the background. Um, and then again, we have this wonder, you know, this wonderful interplay with people on the web. So uh, this, this uh, graphic design student at Yale made a kind of motion magnified portraits of, of other students at Yale. Uh, So, so this column and this column are non-magnified, and this column and this column are motion magnified. So uh, what might you do with this? Well, we're talking with doctors at Mass General to see if there might be applications in this for looking at sort of early diagnosis of Parkinson's or other <coughs> if, um, problems with motor control. So as a sort of proxy for that, just to get that idea across, I took a video of me pressing my fingers together. And here's that video. But really, as you push your fingers together, there are all these little controls back and forth as this side tries to push against that side. And if you motion magnify it, you can see those tiny motions. And so this is kind of a proxy for maybe small uh, motor control problems that, that, that are too early for a physician to pick out, but maybe if they have a motion microscope, they can pick them out. And, and indeed, the sort of canonical picture of a doctor or a nurse is someone with this stethoscope around their neck. What's a stethoscope? It's a motion magnification device, you know, that takes audio frequency signals and, and makes it so you can hear them more clearly, and uh, indicating uh, differences in how things move. And so maybe a visual version of this would also be diagnostically useful for physicians. Um, just another placeholder for looking at people. So here's my son um, bouncing on one foot, and this is uh, high-speed video. It doesn't have to be high-speed video. The previous one wasn't, for example. But here are the different controls that someone has to do in order to keep from falling over when they're bouncing on the foot. And what I really want to do is get a professional ballet dancer and have them be you know, on point and you know, perfectly motionless, but then reveal the different control processes <laughs> that are going on to really keep them from falling over. <laughs> um, let's see, just another one about people. There's a, So this is input, this is motion magnified. You can see the little micro saccades and, and see the, looks like a like jello underwater, which may be what it really is. Um, OK, another one. So the world of tiny motions also makes you think of audio. So uh, here is Mickey Rootstein, who's the, one of the two graduate students whose PhD thesis this was. And he's going to sing for it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fine. So that's what he sang. And um, 
This is the video of, of I'm sorry. Uh, this is a high-speed video of what it looks like on his throat as he made that sound. And here's the power spectrum of the sound he made. So here's frequency along this axis and power along this axis. So let's, let's grab one of those frequencies and motion magnify the narrow band around that to show what vibrations are happening at that fundamental frequency of that sound. So let's extract that frequency. So we're going to filter this image by that and then motion magnify whatever changes happen at that frequency. And, and there you can see that you know, the motion, motions of the throat that correspond with uh, oscillations at that temporal frequency. And so this is what's uh, making that sound inside his throat as, he's, as he vocalizes. And we can, um, let's take a different frequency. Let's take the first harmonic. Um, and I hope you can see that still. Um, Um, so that's what's making the sound of the first harmonic. It's his moving twice as fast, it's a smaller structure. And then just as a control, let's take a non-harmonically related temporal frequency and amplify whatever emotions are going on there. Oops, sorry. And uh, this is good because we don't see any, you know, big structural emotions, it's sort of random noise like that, non-harmonically related. So we have um, a real-time version of this, and actually for a wine glass. Um, we have this really neat demo, which I'm not going to show you, I'm going to show you a video of the demo, all right? Where, um, so if you, you know, if you take a wine glass and you ping it, it's a ding, it's a sound. But we don't, so it so lets you know that it's moving. But we never see a wine glass move. So why do we see a wine glass move? There are two reasons why. Maybe either one and all. We have five frequencies. Emotions are too small. Motions. Perfect. I heard about it. <laughs> and so one person said they're high frequencies. So the, the sound that it, it makes is like a middle C roughly. It's like 450 hertz or something. And that's just way faster for us than we can see. That's one reason why we don't see a wine glass move. And the second reason is because the, the size of the oscillation is very small and we can't see it because it's too small as well. So let's, let's fix both of them in this, this real time demo. To fix the speed problem, we're going to use a special camera that only, for this demo only, that only records uh, in the first millisecond of every video frame. So that's going to stroboscopically subsample the motions at 450 hertz, you know, like wagon wheels rotating backwards in the video. It's going to subsample them down to a temporal frequency of oscillation that we can see. So it look like it's oscillating, but really you're looking at um, many different cycles of oscillation, one after the other, that's been sampled by this uh, special camera. But that only gets rid of one of the problems. That it would still give you what's going to be on the right, on the left-hand side there. Uh, you still can't see it move because it's too small of motion. So then we use the motion microscope to exaggerate that. So here's a video of a real-time demo. So we play a speaker. make a sound, and this thing starts oscillating in sympathetic vibration to it, and now we can see a wine glass oscillate. Um, and then we turn off the sound, and then it rings for a little bit, and then it decays. So uh, we have a real-time version of that, but I didn't bring it with me. But I will do a different video. I'll show you the part of that. Um, so let's see. There's always a certain amount of drama with the real time demo, okay? So bear with me. Alright, so um, so the left hand side is non-motion magnified, the right hand side is motion magnified. There's several controls here. They have the ampl amplification factor, which here is set to zero, so the left and right hand side look the same. And then the other thing I can modify is the center frequency that we're gonna select for and amplify only things at that frequency. Here it's set to two hertz and the bandwidth of that filtering is set to half a hertz. So first let's make it, I'm gonna sort of make it big so you can see it with artifacts and all. So let's, let's amplify, sorry, by factor 37. And let's pick out kind of the low frequency and make it sort of, okay. So I'm not really standing still here. Is that 
you can see here, so it's really. <laughs> um, and we have it set up so when the motion becomes too large, it, it resets. Um, we also get high frequencies, what the heck. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so this is all to say that we have a real-time version of this. Oh, I should stop. <laughs> um, you can also minimize motions by doing exactly what I said, but instead of amplifying, you can uh, minimize the phase changes. So here's a, um, one potential application for that. Here's an uh, astronomical image of the moon through a turbulent Earth atmosphere, and here we're displaying the output of the motion minified version. Um, I believe there are a lot of other ways to solve this problem, and I don't know how this compares with the other. We haven't done a side by side comparison, but this is just a place for this idea. Yeah. Um, so, where do I want to take it? Well, I, you know, if there's a big world of tiny motions outside the body, I think there's also a big world of tiny motions inside the body. Now, I'd love to apply these methods to the ultrasound and MRI data. Again, on the idea that a stethoscope is a useful diagnostic tool, maybe a visual stethoscope is also going to be useful. So we're exploring that uh, possibility. Um, another, so you know, we hope it's a useful tool for scientists, engineers, and maybe for physicians, I don't know. Um, this takes you in several directions. Uh, also, we have code available. Um, and we have this video upload site where you can um, drag and drop videos to process. So, so this has kind of opened up a new research direction for us, you know, the world of tiny motions, because now we can see them. And so we've been, uh, we've looked at exploiting tiny motions in videos to monitor fluid flow. Uh, as the turbulent air moves in front of you, you can see things wiggle just a little bit in the background, and you can use that to, to track the motion of the turbulent air between you and the background. Um, we've looked at these tiny motions in videos to measure sound, so um, we I'll show you that in a second. We uh, looked at a bag of potato chips and used it to convert it to a microphone by watching how it moved. Uh, and then we can also use tiny motions to infer material properties. Uh, you know, hard things oscillate differently than soft things. You can uh, infer properties of a, you can infer stiffness and weight of a set of hanging fabrics by just watching them hang uh, in under the ambient vibrations of the room. But let me show you the sound one. So if we just skip the look at the uh, air flow. <coughs> Sorry, I just got slides and skipping. Okay, visual microphone. So uh, this is work uh, right here. Also, Kate uh, Bowman and Davis. So here's the sort of canonical way you might want to use a visual microphone. So you've got two heads of steak here, and they're talking with a little glass of water there. And it might move a little bit as they're talking. Now, um, I should say, first of all, that the, the real spies, not us, have solved this problem. Again, they can use a laser vibrometer and point it at that water and they can measure uh, small motions. Although, the drawback is you've got this active sensing method. You have to have a, a laser pointing at it. Um, we can do it uh, without a laser. But I should say, at this point, um, they kind of have to be shouting to, for us to really <laughs> get it. So it's not really going to be so useful. Um, but here's the idea. Uh, again, sound waves uh, are, um, are variations in the air pressure, and they're going to make an object move a little bit. That's how a microphone works. But it, it not only works for membranes that we're trying to make it vibrate, it also works for other member membranes as well. So, as well. so we'll, we'll take a high-speed video, watch a cup or a bag of chips or a plant and, and measure the motions just as we did for the motion microscope. But instead of coming up with a modified uh, video sequence, we'll, we'll just come up with a number for how much it's moving and, and then feed that back to a microphone to recover the sound. So here's our microphone, bag of chips. And this is recovered sound from that bag of chips. So I'm looking at it with a camera outside the central class. Here for our for our visualization only, we've, we've uh, motion magnified 
the, the video of that bag of chips. So, so this, this magnified version wasn't used in the processing, it just the, we converted it to numbers and we recorded that, but just it's informative to, to actually see that these things really do move. And we're, there's different uh, band pass filters here, two different temporal frequencies where we can watch the move. Uh, does anyone know why we picked Mary Had a Little Lamb as what to say? Thomas Edison? Yes. Uh, I understand that Thomas Edison said this uh, in some of the early you know, wax cylinder recordings, uh, first phonograph recordings. Um, so that's kind of an homage to him. Um, let's see. sequentially. So the time that you record this line is slightly different than the one when you record the line below it and the line below that. And this gives you really lousy visual artifacts of looking at moving objects because uh, the time that this line was recorded is different than the time that this line was recorded so the thing tilts forward. Or an airplane propeller looks totally wrong. But you can use this to, um, to record high speed oscillations with, uh, with an ordinary frame rate camera. So we, uh, we can actually recover sound from an ordinary video camera using this, exploiting the rolling shutter. So here's, and this is really low quality, but, but at least we can do it. an ordinary video camera. Okay. And then finally, this leads to, uh, we were, you know, but not, the, uh, not the technical highlight of my career, but the science outreach highlights is that we were featured on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And uh, you know, Paul Pounce has some comments which I think are right on the mark. And let me just play for you, uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, talking about this work. Roy. <laughs> Spies who are trying to listen in on private conversations now have a new tool at their disposal. Sophisticated new technology developed at MIT will allow them to eavesdrop on people using what? Drone? No. Oh. You think it's a high-tech kind of thing? Well, it's high-tech, but it actually relies on a, an element in the process that's very low-tech and familiar. 
Maybe I'll give you a local name. Here in Massachusetts, you might use Cape Cod brand to eavesdrop. Cape Cod brand uh, potato chips. Potato chips is the answer, yes. <laughs> Scientists at MIT have figured out a way to eavesdrop on conversations by filming a bag of potato chips in front of the person talking. Their cameras are so incredibly accurate and high definition that they can catch vibrations in the bag that computers can then translate back into the sound that made the vibration, right? So what I mean is a film of the person's potato chips or any other sort of flexible object around them. <laughs> Wait, how close did the bag have yeah, to be? Yeah. If you're going to film the bag, why wouldn't you just come over with a tape recorder? <laughs> Why can't you film their lips? <laughs> or, or is this just for like really corpulent mobsters who hold that bag right up to their mouths? <laughs> to hide from the camera. <laughs> you know, well, what you actually know is going to happen is the really sophisticated criminals are going to start picnicking with Pringles. <laughs> what are you going to do now, coppers? I got a can. Um, Represented. Sorry, I, uh, I think I'll stop there. So, so it's um, we have this tool that lets you see tiny vibrations. It doesn't need doesn't need to be high frequency. It can be ordinary frame rates. Some of those I showed you were ordinary frame rates. It has to be a static camera for what we've shown you so far. Um, what we'd like to take it next in the future would be letting use a handheld camera. Um, but you get the most kind of surprising results typically looking at high-speed imagery, uh, because there isn't enough time in high-speed imagery for things to move very far. So even though there may be informative motions, you can't see them just by looking at and it really is helpful, you think, to have a motion microscope uh, analyzed for you. And we think there are a lot of applications. We, we, you know, we hope it's a, it's a new tool. I mean, it really is a big world of tiny motions, and this lets you see them now. I mean, we hope it's a new tool that might be useful for uh, engineering and analyzing process control, or uh, also there may be applications in uh, medicine um, or uh, in science as well. So uh, thank you very much. And trying to find motions of astronomical logic. Yeah, so I, I'm really intrigued by that. We, um, let's see, right. So uh, I have taken the, I mean, I, I don't know if it'll be useful or not. As an amateur astronomer, I've taken uh, you know photos over time of uh, planets next to the stationary stars, and over the course of the night, you can't see the planet move. But with this, I would think you sh should be able to. And I haven't. I, I want to do it. You should be able to process it to see the the planet as the wandering star to see it actually wander over the course of just an hour or so. You should be able to exaggerate that motion, and um, uh, you know, of course. Um, they have these satellites that go up and look for um, the parallax of, of stars. And um, I don't know if we have things to offer beyond what they do. I mean, now they, they measure their positions really precisely. And, and once you have it all quantified, then you can just manipulate it numerically. Um, anyway, I, I'm interested in astronomical applications. We haven't uh, found a killer one yet. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be possible to do motion line gravitation, even though they're larger scale artifacts? Right. So, um, the question is, can you can you do it even though even in the presence of large motions? And we have we have a CBPR paper this year that addresses that. Basically, it, it stops being the simple signal processing thing that, it, that it used to be. You have to sort of track the large motion, uh, register all the images, and then apply the signal processing approach. Uh, it does work. It's it's not quite as easy as. Just to, as really as a placeholder to show that this method can uh, 
reveal small motions that are going on that you just can't see by eye. Um, we are, it's just actually two weeks ago, we, we met with some neurologists and we hope to uh, start working with them to see if there is value to this, uh, to let me kind of to reveal to the, to the physician uh, small changes that, that aren't really visible by eye. I mean, just really amazing um, other things you can do. I just, I was surprised by one thing when, you, I mean, obviously, obviously looking for these micro expressions. Yeah. I think you're going to be able to do, maybe you don't want to. <laughs> well, well, thanks. I mean, we're, um, uh, yeah. This, yeah. This guy from DARPA came to us and said, you know, if I give you a certain amount of money, can you go look at poker players and see what they're thinking? <laughs> and uh, we kind of looked into it, and they said, eh, my bosses don't want us to really look at poker players. <laughs> so anyway, but we might yet someday explore this. Yeah. Um, um, so it's really fascinating to see these small changes that you can make. Um, so I was wondering, Yeah, so the question was, uh, might this be useful in other non-visual forms of data? And um, yes, I think it would be useful. So the, it's funny, the thing that this offers, like we don't really, mo we don't measure motion better than other people can. I think, I think it's sort of equivalent to what other people can do. But this just provides a visualization component, which really helps. So I think there are other types of, other data sets where you could uh, exaggerate displacements that are being measured. Uh, for example, you know, satellite imagery of the Earth, things like that, and uh, it really depends on how you got the data. If it's GPS coordinates, you, you wouldn't need any of this filtering. You just take the values and amplify them. Uh, uh, so it depends on the data set. But yes, I do think that a similar sort of redisplay for visual consumption uh, can be helpful there as well. Uh, yes? So you, um, you mentioned that sometimes you could do this with uh, low frame rate cameras. Right. So what are the limitations? Uh, you know, if something becomes very noisy or if the frame rate is very low, where does it break down? Right, so the question is, what are the limitations? Where does it break down? High speed, low speed? So, uh, well, it's, it's not magic, and uh, it works better the higher signal noise ratio you have in the camera. And it works better the, the kind of, the, the less the things are moving, um, uh, you know, it's furiously. Um, and so in practice, We've applied a lot more on high-speed videos than ordinary speed or time-lapse videos, just because in a in a slow speed, you know, in a time-lapse video, things are going to move around so much on their own over time that that it, it won't be the kind of nice, stable thing that that works well for motion magnification. Whereas in high-speed videos, things are just rock solid, stable, and, and there might be these tiny motions you want to see, but they're not revealed. Um, but um, I guess the main issue is. All these videos I showed you required a camera on a tripod. Um, and as I said, we have a CVPR paper from this year where we loosened up on that requirement, but it wasn't quite as easy and clean as this. I guess that. So there, there are sort of two systems at play here. There's the, your code, and then there's the human visual system that's yeah. perceiving the image that you generate, right? And so humans have all sorts of strengths and weaknesses and biases and stuff. And so how do you leverage that to sort of improve this, this overall experience? Right, so how do we level, leverage the observer and their experiences and so forth to improve this? Um, well, I guess one way we leverage it is uh, we try to analytically decide what is signal and what is noise. And we try to just mathematically make that distinction. But in practice, what we do is we look at it. And if it looks wrong, it's like, ah, I think we're at my noise, and we scale back. So that's one place we did that. Um, and, and really, I guess, just kind of things looking wrong is, is a kind of, uh, because there, there are all these choices you have to make with the algorithm. You have to pick uh, the, the bandwidth of the filtering and, and the frequencies you want to amplify. And, and again, you can, you can make, it's really easy to make signals that look crazy and, and just rely on the operator to, to help avoid those. Or even a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>